All right, this is a bonus. This was not on our original schedule. Our original schedule had just 12 sessions in which we covered uh, in three sessions an introduction to the Divine Institutions, uh, along with the big scary title of this summer's class, uh, came a lot of explanation. So we defined the institutions, we did an overview of its history, and then we looked at the issue of conscience, volition, and free will. After that, we looked at the three divine institutions that were knitted into the very social fabric at creation, uh, dominion, marriage, and family. And then we saw problems arise because of sin, and so we took a week to look at the corruption of these institutions, but then their stability even through it. God, in his wisdom, built institutions that would not be destroyed, uh, but could become corrupted through sin because sin is corrosive. But then he instituted two more institutions, government and nations, to, uh, to have a global effect of staving the effects of sin. And then we looked at two special institutions that have come since Israel and the church. And then we looked at how these correspond with the coming kingdom. This evening, we look at one that hits a little closer to home for many of us, and that is America. America is not in scripture anywhere, though we are a nation, and nations have been given mandates by God in scripture, and we see, especially in the book of Daniel and in other books, how God operates with nations besides Israel. And so, we want to look a bit at our founding and a bit at our current state of affairs today. Three parts to this message, independence and the institutions. We'll look at the founding of America, its uh, founding purpose, and how those correspond with the divine institutions. We will look at today's present uh, uh, two-party system and the platforms that they ascribe to, mostly the promises that they are um, have given to Americans if they are to win the election this year. And then we'll ask the question, red, white, or blue. First, we look to the Declaration of Independence. The very purpose statement for our nation, the inciting incident which caused us to become a nation. There is great debate today whether or not we are founded on Christian principles, whether or not we are truly one nation under God, built um, uh, on the Word of God. And so we look to the Declaration of Independence into the preamble, and we read the unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, in other words, government as it is uh, seen biblically, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. We see that there is an understanding here that people have, um, have equal uh, stations which have been put there by God. These are observed in the laws of nature, but behind them is nature's God which entitles these rights. They continue, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. This is their preamble, and then they go into their declaration that they are now separating from the tyrannous government of Great Britain. This is the part we are most familiar with. They write, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Once again, looking back to the laws of nature that can be observed, they say that all men are created equal. This is a biblical concept that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. From the very foundation of America, the founding fathers understood that it is not the government which creates rights. It is the government which has the responsibility to recognize the rights that are given to individuals by God, to whom government and individuals are subject. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
We remember when we looked back at the corruption because of sin and the purpose that God had in instituting government was to protect these very aspects of human life on earth. Liberty or freedom, loyalty, fidelity, and life, fruitfulness. In these we see life, liberty, and happiness, though we might articulate it slightly different. This is a very poetic and I would say perfect way to state America's purpose. That to secure these rights, or for the purpose of securing these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. In other words, if ever government comes in the way of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they have a divine mandate as individuals, as citizens of that nation, to overthrow their own government or to throw off the chains of their government because their government no longer acts by divine mandate. It is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government. Notice that they did not recognize any legitimacy of anarchy. Both in this, uh, in this founding document, we see the rejection of anarchy and we see the rejection of despotism and tyranny. We see instead governance for the purpose of freedom, governments for the purpose of protection and um, allowing individuals to live freely within the bounds of the nation so that they might uh, live to God. Laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. As they continue, they put the weight of the uh, founding of this nation on prudence. Prudence, which is wisdom. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. They recognize that this is not something to do lightly. This is not something to do just because things aren't going your way for the moment or even for somewhat a long time. I think this is a very important thing for us to keep in mind, whether elections go our way or not. That does not mean we overthrow the government. It means we do what we can to affect change within that government, within its bounds. We do have to respect the uh, divine institution of government as much as we are to instruct it. This is a very basic principle of conservatism. On the other side, we have liberalism, which constantly wants to throw off norms and standards and traditions. We see the wisdom of history, the wisdom of tradition, and what stands a long time generally does so because it works. On the other side, there is progressivism, which wants to constantly try new things and would very quickly throw off a form of government which it does not approve of. And so they're saying by wisdom, governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. Light causes, meaning causes that are not sufficiently um, extreme, and transient, meaning we don't want to find permanent solutions to temporary problems. Actually, that's uh, Anthony Fauci quote. I'm going to have to wash my mouth out with soap after this. <laughs> and accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. In other words, we tend to just stick it out rather than make change. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evidences a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. 
The founding of America was not done lightly. Even under such great tyranny, these founding colonies saw that God was ultimately the sovereign over nations and that to throw off their despotic nation, Great Britain, ought to be done under the guidance of wisdom. They saw that it was not only their right at this point to do so, but their duty as people not to subject themselves to a government which did not allow the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so they saw it also their responsibility to establish a new form of government, one which was more conducive to the divine institutions, one which was more biblically sound, allowing for freedom. They continue, such has been the patient suffering of these colonies. They did not do this lightly. They did not do this without wisdom, consulting God through his word and through prayer. And such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former system of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. We're going to skip the rest of all of this uh, evidence of the king's uh, tyranny against these colonies. Most of the page of the Declaration of Independence is listing his injustices. They come down to their conclusions, though, and in their concluding paragraph, they write this. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. They come as a representative government of their people, and they come not an appeal to the uh, nation of Great Britain, but rather an appeal to the supreme judge of the world. They recognize God's sovereignty as the ultimate sovereignty over any sovereignty of a nation, and they see that they are duty-bound not to their nation but to God to protect those they represent by establishing a form of government which reflects God's design for human society. And so they see these intentions as justified, rectified before God. And so they do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, recognizing that they are not uh, in authority over the people they represent, but they are under the people's authority. They solemnly publish and declare that these United States are and of right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiances to the British crown, and that all political connections between them and the states, state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. America, at its founding, was working against globalism. Now, we don't necessarily have a terrible problem with colonization as conservatives, but globalism is antithetical to scripture. A lot of what Great Britain was doing had more in common with Nimrod's expansion of his governmental powers and ultimately a, an attempt to take over the world than it did to individual nation states acting sovereignly within their boundaries. And so America is not trying to build a consortium of international uh, nation states through which to rule the world, but rather are seeking the freedom in their own land to pursue their own biblical values apart from the tyranny of the king. A word of explanation, looking back one paragraph, what they mean by absolving all uh, uh, political connections. This does not mean that they will not uh, have foreign relations with Great Britain. It means that they are not duty-bound to Great Britain under its government. They say, we have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations. They're speaking of their 
former uh, colleagues in the state, their former citizens, uh, the citizens who, which remain uh, citizens under Great Britain, they're saying, we have even tried to talk to these individuals, and that has not worked either, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondences. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war and in peace, friends. In other words, we must treat those who are formerly consanguinous, meaning of the same blood, the same nation as us, we must hold them as we hold all other foreign nations. If in time of war, enemies in war. If in time of peace, friends. The conclusion of the Declaration of Independence states this, that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, to conclude peace, to contract alliances, to establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. They're here recognizing their role and responsibility as a nation. They have the right primarily to levy war and to conclude peace. The international uh, relations with foreign countries are to be conducted by the structure of government to contract alliances with foreign nations, to establish commerce. And uh, contextually here, this appears to be international commerce or trade between the nations. Unfortunately, in our modern iteration, we have, I think, uh, at my last observation, more regulations concerning internal trade than external trade, more tax revenue coming from internal uh, commerce than external commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. Now remember up at the top of the page at the very beginning in the preamble, where do they see their rights coming from? They don't create them, but rather they recognize that these rights are given by God. In other words, they are duty bound to do what God has designed for government to do and not to do else. And finally, for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. I think it goes without saying, based on the declaration of our own independence, that this nation's founding was founded on a Judeo-Christian ethic a Judeo-Christian understanding of what government is and ought to do, and with a pledge ending it, based on divine providence, the recognition of God as the one who brings up and takes down leaders, the one who establishes the nations according to his purposes, who draws the lines and borders, who has at this time duty bound to them to govern the people under their charge in liberty and freedom or freedom and uh, life. <laughs> Often, today especially, we hear touted the need for democracy. I think in the last day or two with the most recent assassination attempt of former President Donald Trump, once again we see all of the statements of the left that may have conflagrated the situation. And usually that is that he is a threat to our democracy. We are not a democracy. We are a threat to the form of government which they would like to impose upon us, but which is not our government. Our government is a constitutional republic. It is not one of the tyranny of the 51%. It is not one of the popular vote. It is one of representative government. This was part of the prudence or wisdom of our founding fathers in recognizing that all men are born equal, but men are not born good. Men are not born sinless. This is very prudent because this was the very purpose of establishing government. God handed down 
the roles and responsibility of government because man was corrupt and all of his intentions were only evil all the time. And God had promised not to destroy the world as he did in Noah's age, despite the fact that man was not good, that man would head towards further corruption. Government, if it does not recognize the very nature of humanity, does not recognize the nature of its responsibility. And so having a constitutional republic builds in those checks and balances, which help to maintain peace and justice, despite the fact that sinful man hold positions of power. In the preamble of the Constitution, written about 10 years after our Declaration of Independence, the Founding Fathers write, We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. Again, great prudence recognizing that no union is going to be perfect until the kingdom comes. In order to form a more perfect union, something better than they had before, which was their right and responsibility to dissolve and to establish something more conducive to life and liberty, we establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general warfare, and secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. We do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. In order to form a more perfect union, they saw their responsibilities as protecting domestic um, life and liberty and protecting domestic life and liberty from foreign threats. They see this as the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And again, as we saw from the foundation, they recognize this blessing of liberty is coming from God as they operate under the institutions. What form of government they handed down was one, again, of prudence, one in which there were checks and balances on the power. This was both from experience and also by uh, historical study, seeing the traditions of government in other nations, their rise and their fall, but also through biblical wisdom, and I would say primarily through biblical wisdom. Our Constitution has three articles, each one not too long to read in a single sitting, and it's well worth doing. And it dictates three different branches of government, our legislative, executive, and judicial. We have a tendency, as we always seek a Messiah, to look at the executive branch as the most powerful, when in fact the legislative branch is designed to be the most powerful branch of government. When we look at the government tree here, we see the center of the trunk represented by the executive branch. Why? Because we always have a tendency to seek a king, to seek a figurehead. And right now, our political elections look a lot more like a high school popularity contest and not much like, uh, not much like the Constitution designed our government to function. When we look at these three branches, we see that the legislative is the one that has the most interaction with both domestic and foreign policy. The executive branch is the primary place of foreign policy. The judicial branch is the primary location of uh, domestic policy. Legislative creates the laws that the judiciary will uh, enact, and the legislature uh, gives permission or a vote of confidence, essentially, and funding for warfare, which the executive branch commands. I do like in their uh, in the Declaration of Independence, their emphasis on the need for prudence, because as we go in, we see a lot of wisdom in how each of these branches are designed. We see that there is to be one president. Initially, there were not term limits on it. Now we have term limits. We see four-year terms in the Senate or the uh, Congress. We have two-year and six-year terms. 
and in the courts we have lifelong terms. These are not arbitrary by any means. The lengths of time may have been somewhat arbitrary, but the staggering of these helps to keep from a full turnover in the government to keep some form of consistency, um, even in the uh, election years, which we have uh, most turnover, but especially in the courts, giving them lifelong terms so that they have no need to fear re-election and the loss of power or uh, repercussions for following the dictates of the law. When we look at the presidential or the executive branch, we see that three different and very important branches come off of this. We have the president who is the commander in chief, the head of the military. We have the vice president who is the president of the Senate. And we have the cabinet, which is not elected, but appointed by the president and confirmed by the legislative, one of those checks and balances. The legislative branch is the House of Representatives and the Senate together, giving equal but also proportionate represent representation to each state. Why? Because though we are a federal government, we also have state governments, and our state government is actually closer to, uh, closer to us than our federal government. We do tend to think of our federal elections as far more important than our local state and local uh, city and township elections, but those actually dictate far more uh, our freedoms in our day-to-day -day lives. This is why we as Washingtonians complain far more than, say, those in Florida because we have a very left-leaning local government and our freedoms are not necessarily the same as the freedoms of those living in Florida or other uh, states, um, which tend to lean more conservative. However, this also helps to... Uh, uh, this is also a good example of representational government in that the people of the states are represented as well as the states themselves um, as if they were individual entities being represented when laws are being created by the federal government to establish how we ought to uh, pursue justice and righteousness within the nation, uh, life and liberty, that is. On the other side, we have the Supreme Courts, and the federal courts going down to the local courts, and it is there where we are judged based on the laws created by the legislature. Now, all of this falls apart if prudence is not pursued, if wisdom is not pursued in all places. We saw back in the Constitution that we are to establish justice and to ensure domestic tranquility. Establishing justice is the role of the legislature and the judiciary. This is a responsibility that requires wisdom, wisdom outside of themselves, not pragmatism, but rather biblical understanding of what justice actually is. When we no longer have that, justice becomes haphazard. Justice becomes, once again, the tyranny no longer of the 51% or even of representatives, but tyranny of an oligarchical class that has been democratically elected, but does not represent its constituents. To ensure domestic tranquility, the laws of the land need to be enforced just as much as they need to be just and in accordance with wisdom. We have the provision for the common defense. Regardless of your political persuasions in the early 2000s, we saw this happen when George Bush uh, declared the beginning of a war based on what? A threat to the life and security of individuals within the nation. When two planes hit the World Trade Centers, the loss of almost 3,000 American lives, it was the right thing to do for the President of the United States to declare war and to retaliate. How that went about, we can have 
lots of discussion about, but it would have been the wrong thing to do to allow the nation to have been attacked and not to respond. This is the promotion of the general welfare of the public, the protection of life and liberty. What this does not uh, constitute, but which often it is used, is to establish a welfare system where the nation becomes mommy and daddy rather than government. And this is to secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, the recognition that we are handing the government down to our children in the next generations. So how does this line up then with our uh, divine institutions? We saw that this was very wisely established to protect and uh, from evil internally and externally. It stays within its bounds, in other words. It establishes government and it establishes foreign policy. That's what a government is supposed to do. Government is not here to mandate the individual lives of those uh, living within it. Yet those are the primary aspects of our arguments today on the political sphere. We do have a two-party system kind of de facto here in the United States. It's always a Republican and a Democrat uh, come election day. Sometimes there's a bit of a spoiler in there, but these two represent two very different diametrically opposed ideas of liberty and freedom. For this, we're just simply going to look at the promises in the Republican platform and the table of contents in the Democratic platform. They did not have a, a nice and concise list of promises, uh, essential mandates in their platform, but their table of contents is very instructive nonetheless. The Republican platform lists these promises to seal the border and to stop the migrant invasion, a recognition of uh, national sovereignty and the division between one nation and another, to carry out the largest deportation operation in history, in other words, to empower ICE and the police to actually enforce the laws of this nation, for the nation to do its job, to end inflation and to make America affordable again, here it doesn't indicate how, but as you read on in the party platform, we see this is by cutting regulations that America has put on the working class and on um, uh, corporations that hinder their ability to uh, essentially have money to pay their people or to innovate within, uh, within that uh, economy. To make America the dominant energy producer in the world by far. Again, how do they uh, intend to do this? As you read on, you see this is once again by cutting regulations. Most of these regulations have been inserted because of uh, climate ideology, not because of prudent governance. To stop outsourcing and to turn the United States into a manufacturing superpower large tax cuts for workers, and no tax on tips. Uh, this he actually has expanded in recent weeks. No tax on tips, no tax on uh, the money that old people get. What's that called? Social Security. Thank you, Social Security. <laughs> You're on Social Security already, Jenna? You're just a spring chicken. Okay. Okay, that's not old then, that's disabled. <laughs> okay, his title is literally elder. <laughs> no offense, Mark, no offense. I am an elder, yes. Yes, I kind of feel like a Mormon sometimes. <laughs> Large tax cuts for workers, no tax on tips, no tax on Social Security, and recently no tax on overtime. All of these are meant to 
help individuals keep their own product so that they can invest it wisely in their future and in their success. To defend our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, and our fundamental freedoms, including freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and the right to keep and bear arms. To prevent World War III and to restore peace in Europe and in the Middle East and build a great Iron Dome missile defense shield over our entire country, all made in America. I'll be honest, until I looked at the Democratic or the Republican platform this week, I did not know that that was in here. Um, that's very interesting. Uh, but to prevent World War III and to restore peace. This is ultimately the purpose of warfare. It is not to go and find uh, places to expand your power and your influence in the world, but to restore peace for the people under your charge. To end the weaponization of government against the American people. That is a very telling promise, one that uh, indicates very well what is happening today, especially with all of the government regulations on the first divine institution, the divine institution of dominion, which um, instructs us to work. To stop the migrant crime epidemic, demolish the foreign drug cartels, and to crush gang violence, and to lock up violent offenders. This is a two-pronged fork dealing both with our domestic and our foreign government. To seal off the border, as he, they said in the very first promise, and to go beyond sealing it off and to deal with the problems that have sprung up because the border is leaking like a sieve, bringing foreign nationals into the United States who are committing crimes, not being prosecuted for those crimes, and also not being deported when they commit those crimes. Also, keeping in mind that crossing the border illegally is a crime. Um, to rebuild our cities, including Washington, D.C., making them safe, clean, and beautiful again. To strengthen and modernize our military, once again understanding the role of government, making it without question the strongest and most powerful in the world. This is not to conquer the world, once again, but this is so that we can protect against any threat that the world might pose to our safety, our liberty, our freedom within our nation. To keep the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. This is to protect our uh, first divine institution because the government does not produce, the government protects. To allow individuals to produce, to innovate, to better their own lives, to better the lives of their children, to provide for their own children. The government provides protection and part of this, yes, is economic protection against uh, foreign governments which would, or foreign um, threats to our, uh, our domestic economic freedoms. When we look at the uh, budget for 2023 in our country, we see that defense is one of the largest individual uh, budgetary items here at 13% of the budget. This is often a point of debate. All of the Democrats get all up in arms that we're spending way too much on defense and we should be spending more on other mandatory programs. Things that have been promised to the American people, rather than seeing their primary role and responsibility as government being defending, rather than trying to provide like mommy and daddy for the individuals uh, in the nation. What ends up happening is they make people so dependent on the government for their income by regulating and making it impossible for wealth to actually accumulate among the population uh, that you need to go to mommy and daddy government just in order to survive. When we look at the defense budget um, itself, we see that it last year was $820 billion at 13% of uh, the budget and that there are many things nested under that, all which uh, are supposed to go towards helping us remain safe in this nation. 13% of our budget is not much for the protection of every individual, both here and abroad, that belongs to this nation. 
Unfortunately, both sides of the political spectrum seem to have a hard time spend or uh, not spending on things that are not necessary. So that this year, for the very first time, our interest payments on debt has surpassed our uh, our defense budget. Defense of 13%. Up there we see last year our net interest was 11%. This year it has gone over 13%. As we continue, the Republican platform says they will fight for and protect Social Security and Medicare with no cuts, including no changes to the retirement age. I have my own political problems with this statement. I'll leave that um, out there, but anything I disagreed with I put in blue, anything I agreed with I put in red. Uh, if I thought it was biblical, I put it in red. Uh, that, uh, that may have been very intentional, the color choice. To cancel the electric vehicle mandate and to cut costly and burdensome regulations. Once again, cutting regulations that have been artificially opposed on the people of the United States, making it more difficult for them to afford their daily life, their necessities, their, um, their ability to provide for themselves and for family, and to help and be supportive in their communities. To cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, radical gender ideology, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content on our children. This, I think, is one of the most to the point promises in the Republican platform that promises adherence to a biblical view of government, divine institutions, protecting our marriages and families from what government would push on them that is contrary to wisdom. To keep men out of women's sports, to deport pro-Hamas radicals, and to make our college campuses safe and patriotic again, to secure our elections, including same-day voting, voter identification, paper ballots, and proof of citizenship, to unite our country by bringing it to, uh, bringing it to new and record levels of success. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness seems to be the main thrust of the Republican national platform. When we turn to the Democratic platform, we do see things that uh, are consistent with the divine institutions, but the problem is how many we see that are not consistent with it. The problematically, uh, and this again was just a table of contents, there are topics which are important in the arguments of uh, how we ought to live, but when they go in and express their plans of how to do these things, or what they think ought to be done about them, very often what they promote is contrary to biblical wisdom. They seek economic progress. This is well-intentioned, but how do they plan to do this? Investing in America. Uh, I think we all saw the interview that Kamala gave to an obscure news uh, platform the other day where she was asked for some specifics about how she plans to invest in America. And her answer was she grew up in a middle-class home and people really liked their lawns. Yeah. <laughs> and her conclusion in that is we have to invest in America. There are no specifics given. They want to create good jobs. Now I have a problem with this on both sides of the aisle when the Republicans or the Democrats in power say they are creating jobs. It is not the government's role to create jobs. It is the government's role to protect freedom so that you can produce and maintain a job. Democrats used to be very well known as the, uh, the party of the working class man promoting small businesses. While they still remain on the outside, or they still claim this on the outside, what we see in practicality is that they are more interested in supporting big pharma and big government uh, and big ag rather than uh, protecting small businesses. In fact, it was small businesses that were most um, affected by the 
coronavirus lockdowns under the Biden administration. Fighting poverty, ending special interest giveaways. Chapter two looks at rewarding work rather than rewarding wealth. In principle, that's a good idea. Rewarding those who work hard rather than just rewarding wealth. But in America, how does one become wealthy? There are a few ways how an individual becomes wealthy, but ultimately wealth accumulates through hard work. It might be handed down from generation to generation. That should not be punished. Just because a family has been innovative, a family has worked hard, and has, over its generations, lived the American dream of building up their wealth, does not mean they deserve to have it taken from them and redistributed to those who have not. They do promise tax cuts. For working families, they promise that anyone making less than four hundred thousand dollars will not have any tax increases. But this is a promise they have given before, and the problem is, it never bears out. Every time they put in tax cuts, what ends up happening is the individual pays more in taxes. In fact, we remember back to the Inflation Reduction Act that was、uh, put in place two years ago.、Um, it was one of the Uh, chief accomplishments of the Biden administration, and just recently Biden has admitted that it should have been named what it actually is,、uh, because it had nothing to do with lowering inflation. It had everything to do with、uh, climate ideology. Often, they say one thing and do another, and that's the problem. Making the wealthy and big corporations pay their fair share. What they mean by this, because they operate not on equality but equity, is to make them pay more than their fair share. Not to treat them equally, but to treat them equitably. Because they are more successful, they ought to be brought down to the same level, and others ought to be lifted up to their level, artificially. Chapter three: Lowering costs, healthcare and prescription drugs, childcare, home care, paid leave, gas and groceries, corporate greed, housing, education, social security, pensions, and Medicare. All of this boils down to government subsidies and artificial regulations on corporations that would increase prices, such as gas and groceries. Unfortunately, what happens there when you try to regulate what、uh, is so-called、uh, price gouging? Uh, first, it's economically、uh, ignorant because they do not understand all of the prices that go into a price that is posted, and how little is actually made by each individual at each stage. When they regulate the prices of these things, the thing becomes more scarce because it's more expensive to make, more expensive to produce. More expensive than for us. They want to subsidize all things like housing and education and healthcare and childcare. And once again, this is removing the responsibility from the individual under the first divine institution, and handing it over to the government to produce for the individual. Chapter four: Tackling the climate crisis, lowering energy costs, and securing energy independence. Ironically, it was the Biden administration that ended our four-year string of energy independence under Donald Trump. They want to promote, pro produce cleaner, more affordable energy. They do want to produce cleaner energy. Unfortunately, every way that they go about this does not actually produce cleaner energy. I don't think they have any intention to make affordable energy. This seems to be just plainly a lie. And、when you go into their platform and you see how they plan to do this, it's utter nonsense. It's not cutting regulations; it's adding more regulations, lowering energy costs, creating clean energy jobs. Once again, creating jobs, reducing pollution, and making polluters pay. Problem with this is once again it is arbitrary. It is. Not equally、uh, affected within the country, and essentially, what this turns into is 
policing the individual's ability to uh, promote and uh, procure their own pursuit of happiness within the freedom of this country. All of this is really wrapped up, I think, in this one point I've highlighted in purple, environmental justice. Notice that to this point, we're in chapter four of the democratic platform, their actual roles and responsibility as government have barely, if even, been touched. When they finally get to the issue of justice, which they should be uh, very keen to do, we see that it's not cr criminal justice, it's, it's environmental justice. Building climate resilient communities, conservation, and glo global climate leadership. This is one aspect of globalism here. Chapter five, protecting communities and tackling the scourge of gun violence. Gun safety, policing and public safety, criminal justice, violence against women. Finally, they get to criminal justice. Unfortunately, what they want to do is criminally unjust. They want to take away the ability of the individual to protect himself from a tyrannous government. It is ironic that the Democratic Party is the one so concerned about threats to democracy, which should probably be interpreted, I think, to the best of their intentions, threats against our gov constitutional government. And yet, they are the party that also wants to take away the ability of the individual to protect that the way that the Founding Fathers designed it. It seems that the ones who are loudest about protecting the Constitution actually are working against the protection of the institution or of the Constitution. This is the longest chapter. Chapter 6, Strengthening Democracy, Protecting Freedoms, and Advancing Equity. They talk here about judges. They uh, do not say it in the democratic platform here, but what has been uh, promoted by Joe Biden in his presidency has been stacking the Supreme Court. They were very unhappy with the actual due process checks and balances of Donald Trump putting three justices on the Supreme Court for lifetime terms, three justices which interpret the Constitution in context. Rather, they want to put on justices that interpret the Constitution as a living and changing document, one that is not found in absolute truth of the letters of the text. Voting rights. Remember, the, Demo or the Republican platform wants to make sure that voting is fair and protected. Here, voting rights, when you go in and read the platform, what it wants is for people not to be checked for their citizenship, not to be required to have um, uh, identification, and not to have paper ballots, but to have mail-in ballots and to be able to vote early. All of these things work against our ability to ensure free and fair elections. Stopping the influence of special interests, reproductive freedom, one of these uh, very uh, carefully crafted terms, which actually means the right of a mother to kill her own child. Women's rights, racial equity, again, not equality, racial equity, spurning the flames of racism in America. If you have not seen it, I, re I really recommend going to see Matt Walsh's new movie, Am I Racist? It is excellent movie. I saw it on opening night and I was laughing the entire time but it is also a very serious topic that he handles very well. They have a whole section here in chapter six on LGBTQI plus issues. They are very uh, uh, pro word salad here. The issue of disabilities, of tribal nations, combating hate and protecting freedom of religion and freedom of the press arts and humanities, and this is an interesting one that they tack in here, DC, Puerto Rico, and territories. These are two very democratically leaning territories 
that they would like to uh, install as states, which would swing the power of the Electoral College very squarely in democratic power. Just like stacking the courts would allow them to uh, basically push through their own mandates, so uh, turning DC and Puerto Rico into states would help them swing the um, electoral college towards democratic uh, candidates in every foreseeable election. So when they say that Donald Trump is a threat to democracy, that there will never again be a free and fair election, that there will never again be a democratic uh, candidate who can win if Donald Trump gets in there and changes everything and enshrines himself as permanent dictator, uh, everything in their platform is geared not towards the protection of individuals, their freedom, their liberty, and their pursuit of happiness for them to do for themselves what they can to get up a leg in this world. They want to artificially lift up some, artificially press down others, and to enshrine themselves as the power class for the foreseeable future. Chapter 7, Securing Our Border and Fixing the Broken Immigration System. How many times did they rail against Donald Trump for building a uh, border wall? This is racist. This is anti-democratic. This is contrary to everything the president should be doing when his job is protecting from foreign threats. Suddenly, when she was trailing in the polls, Kamala Harris comes out for securing the border wall. Expanding legal immigration and deterring illegal immigration. Chapter 8, Advancing the President's Unity Agenda. Beating the op opioid epidemic. Investing in mental health. Protecting kids online. Strengthening America's data privacy. And promote, promoting competition. Ending cancer as we know it. Now, if you think they have no answers for how they're going to invest in America, this one they truly have no answers for and meeting our nation's sacred obligation to veterans and military families. Lastly, Chapter 9, Strengthening American Leadership Worldwide, Europe, Indo-Pacific, China, Middle East, North America, North Africa, Western Hemisphere, Africa, Strengthening the U.S. and Global Economy, Leading with Diplomacy and American Values, Strongest Military in the World. Now we share in the Republican platform, having the strongest military in the world. But when you go in and you read what they mean by strengthening American leadership worldwide, it essentially is globalism. It essentially is America being the leader of a global empire, but uh, also kind of strangely ceding power and influence to other governments such as China. Now in all of this, uh, my political leadings are blatantly obvious, I think. Um, but we ask the question, red, white, or blue? We can go decades, generations, thinking that we are going to have uh, everything that we have ever hoped for or needed in life because our president got in or our presidential candidate was elected or we think the world is over because the one that we didn't want gets in. The left survived four years of Trump. Most of them got tax cuts. We just survived four years of Biden. You're here. <laughs> you are here. It's not easy. Yes, our yeah. No, it's not easy. It's not always easy. But I think we would be just as disingenuous to say that we can't survive four years of a Democratic president as the left is when they say they can't survive four years of a Republican president. Why? Because of the wisdom of how this nation was established. Just like our founding fathers, we're not going to throw everything to the wind because these four years aren't going to be easy. Because these eight years might not be easy. But there does come a time, and hopefully it's not in any of our immediate futures, though I think some of us start to see the writing on the wall, there would come a time in which it would become our right and duty to throw off 
such a tyrannous form of government, and it would equally be our duty to establish another form of government that would probably look a lot like the origins of our own nation, returning to that good foundation. But we know that however young our country is, just 250 years old, almost, that doesn't mean we are too big to fail, doesn't mean we're too young to fail. Nations have lasted longer and nations have lasted shorter than America. Nations have risen and fallen for lesser and greater reasons. Our hope is not in any political candidate any more than it is in our own nation. Our own nation's purpose is to allow individuals to live their lives for God. God is our hope. Christ is our hope. We have the benefit as Christians within this nation, not only to live for God within the confines of this political system, to promote justice and peace with biblical wisdom, but to share that hope with everyone else in our nation. And when we appear just as hopeless because we have staked our bets on one political party and we become hopeless when they lose, then we are not actually doing our best as Christians in this nation. It's not just about our vote. It's about how we live our lives. It's about how we think, how we operate, how we talk to the people around us. Looking forward always to the coming king, recognizing that if Trump gets into office, he's not going to fix all the problems. If Kamala gets into office, oh boy, she may cause a lot more problems. We might even, uh, this will be incredibly hypothetical, we might even lose our lives. It could be from either one. I mean, I'm not that old, but it seems like tensions are higher than ever in my life. And when I sit and imagine the day after the election, it's hard to see either one of these winning and violence not ensuing. How do we as Christians handle that? Before we come to our conclusion, let's look at these seven divine institutions and just rhetorically ask ourselves which party will allow us the most freedom to live our lives for God. And then let's use that opportunity to vote wisely, to share with our fellow believers and with others the prudence and the wisdom of biblical, a biblical understanding of society, of the nation state, and our responsibilities in it. And let's not be like some who we uh, saw almost eight years ago now, and then four years ago, staking all our hope on our political candidate. I used to watch almost every Sunday this one pastor down in California. I cheered with him when 2020, the day after uh, the election, or I guess five days after the election, when Trump surprisingly won. And I think he rightly saw this as a gift from God, giving us opportunity for freedom and liberty when it seemed very hopeless. But then four years later, when Trump lost, he fell to his knees on stage, raised his hands and said, why God, why? And I was so embarrassed, I turned it off and I never listened to that pastor again. He staked all his hope on Donald Trump. And when Donald Trump lost, God had failed him. We don't want to be like that. We want our strength of confidence to be in Christ. Concerning responsible dominion, which party promotes incentivizing work and which incentivizes welfare? 
which incentivizes individuals who otherwise could work not to work. For some, it's cheaper to sit home and receive welfare than to go and get a job and be taxed through the nose. Which one promotes taxation and redistribution of wealth? Now, when we think of this down at its very roots, taxation, especially overtaxation, is the government taking your money and spending it on your behalf as if they are more responsible with that money than you would be? Which party platform increases the regulatory burden on the economy? Concerning marriage. Now this is one where both party platforms don't have much to say. They have some, especially in feminism and transgenderism. But both party platforms have accepted most of this. But which ones allow us the freedom, the most freedom, to pursue a biblical view of marriage? Where divorce isn't promoted or seen as a neutral even, where gay marriage isn't provo- promoted as a, uh, as a new virtue, where feminism isn't used to usurp the male headship in the family, to promote singleness among young women who then become attached to the government. I, th- I can't remember who said it. I heard it from someone recently, but it uh, tends to be that men and women attached to men vote Republican, and women detached from men vote Democrat. Why? Because they want to be told what to do. I also have another good joke from Ronald Reagan. said so this woman came into a, uh, a dress-fitting shop asking for a wedding gown. The attendant asked her what kind of gown she would like, and she said a white dress with a veil. As they go on talking, the uh, shop attendant finds out that this is the woman's fourth marriage. And she says, You know, you might want to find a dress a little bit more suitable to your situation. Usually, a white dress and veil are reserved for someone in a bit more innocent situation. And she says, well, allow me to explain here. My first husband, we got married, and he unfortunately died on our wedding night of a terrible accident. We were madly in love. My second husband and I, we got in such a bad argument on the way to our reception that we annulled the marriage and we never spoke again. My third husband was a Democrat. (laughs) He sat on the bed that night and told me just how good it's going to be. (laughs) So she was in a very innocent position. Which party promotes the family and the biblical role of family to protect and to promote the welfare of the child? One party pushes and defends transgender ideology being forced on children, and it strips the parents of their rights to say nay. One party is the party of parental rights, especially in the area of the child's education. Another wants the child to be attached to the government and for the parents to have no say about how or what that child is taught. One party pushes environmental ideology over the divine institution of family so that Some even claim it is an environmental injustice. Now remember that environmental justice that is in the Democratic Party platform. It is an environmental injustice to have children because children destroy the environment, people destroy the environment, and we should reduce the population. 
AOC has famously said that she is doing her civic duty by not having children. None of us can complain, I think. But at the same time, that is the wrong message, especially for a representative of the American people. One party promotes abortion, wants to enshrine it as a federal right. Unfortunately, this year's Republican platform has scrubbed the abortion issue. But under the last uh, Trump uh, administration, he appointed the conservative judges who overturned Roe v. Wade and turned the issue back to the states, allowing greater representation of the individuals within those states. Now, I personally might think that just like murder is wrong on all levels, even at the federal level, individual states have the right to decide how they punish it, but they can't not punish it federally. I think the same should go for abortion. Murder is murder. But Republican and Democrat is a mechanism for winning elections. The party platform is just that. Their promises, a mechanism for getting the most people to vote for your candidate. Which ones understand the proper role of government? Which ones seek to protect innocent life? Which ones seek to prosecute crime? Again, Kamala Harris is uh, very quick to tell us that she was a prosecutor and she is going to be a pre prosecutor president and she's going to prosecute the former president. But unfortunately, she has a long history of not prosecuting crime in California where she was responsible to prosecute crime. Unless you're pro-life, exactly. Which one seeks rights from God and which one seeks to create new rights? In terms of national distinctions, internationalism, globalism, which one seeks international strength? Which one seeks international cooperation consistent with globalism? Which one promotes border defense and has the best record of promoting border defense? Which one recognizes the sovereignty of the nation and does not try to cede the power and the rights of the individuals to foreign operatives? Which one recognizes Israel's right to defend itself? Which one seeks to assist in the mutual deterrence of enemies? Concerning the church, which one allows for religious freedoms and the separation of church and state the way it was meant to be? Not keeping the church from ever influencing government, but keeping the government from influencing the church. We have had too many generations go by now thinking that it is inappropriate to talk about politics from the pulpit because it's divisive. Politics is the fabric that knits us together in a polity, how we choose to live together. And if that is not based on biblical morals, if that's not based on biblical wisdom, what is informing it? James is very clear that there are two different kinds of wisdom. If the wisdom of God is not allowed to influence our politics, then it is the wisdom that is natural demonic and from below. This might be why our country is in such bad state today, because the church has been silent for decades about just simply talking about morals in the public sphere. We want to moralize everyone, make everyone feel bad for not acting like Christians, but we don't want to actually vote like Christians. Which party will allow us to pursue the freedom of a Judeo-Christian ethic, to promote those things which are righteous and just? 
and to speak against those things which are unjust, which are contrary to God. I'll end with two verses here, looking forward to the Lamb and His perfect righteous government. Because although we will all make a decision here in 2024 about how we are to live the next four years under which platform, ultimately, our perfect government is on its way. We have the guarantee that we will one day enter in because we have trusted in Christ. Isaiah 9, 6, the prophet writes, a child will be born to us, and he has been. A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. We should not treat any political leader as if he were worthy of these titles. Even a human Messiah would not be worthy of these titles, but only a divine Messiah, which is Jesus Christ. The prophet continues, there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. And political action and equity will accomplish this? Not by a long shot. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. We are not going to bring in the kingdom by political activism. We make our lives more comfortable so that we can live peaceably and quietly in this life. That is the role of our vote. And so, if, and I hope we don't, if we lose this election, we still want to live peaceably and quietly. We don't want to cause the commotion that is bound to ensue no matter which one wins, but we want to point everybody towards the coming of the perfect peace in Christ. The last two verses here, Daniel 2, 44 and 45. In the days of those kings, speaking of the coming confederation of uh, kings and the government of the Antichrist, the last government that this world will see, and it will be one of globalism and tyranny. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, and the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future, so the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. We know what will happen in the future. We become very destabilized because we do not know what will happen in 62 days in our country but we know the end of the story. We know that our nation is not even present in the end. It might exist. It's not a global player, not important enough to mention. We don't need to be here. As Americans, we like to think of ourselves as the most important thing on planet Earth. And I lived in Canada for four years. Let me tell you, we are. <laughs> But what is important is Christ, his coming kingdom, and that we're not trying to build a kingdom for him to come and take over. No matter what we build here on earth, it will pale in comparison to what he will bring with him, the stone cut without hands, the kingdom that is coming in glory. Before we pray, just a reminder that our conference starts this week. Now that you guys are all experts on the divine institutions, we have a three-day conference on the divine institutions. We'll have Andy Woods, Jeremy Thomas, Paul Miles all here to rehash all these issues, 
to do it much better than I ever could, and to share a few other special topics with us. So I hope you'll all join us uh, this weekend. Let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you and we praise you uh, for your wisdom in um, establishing these social structures for us to live lives that would glorify you, for us to, uh, to have a voice in our own political uh, climate here. And though things seem very tense uh, and tenser by the day, uh, we know that our hope is firmly grounded in you and that we will not be shaken. Though we might endure four more years of suffering, honestly, regardless of who wins, we know that eternal peace, eternal justice, eternal righteousness is soon on its heels. And no matter which form of government we live by here on earth, no matter which leaders uh, dictate the uh, day-to-day lives of the individuals, we know that all of it will pale in comparison to your kingdom. And so we keep our eyes firmly fixed on your return, and we praise your coming. We pray in the name of the Son, Jesus. Amen.